Modern cars measure tire pressure and display it on the dashboard. How does this technology work? Can we use it for our projects? And what happens if we try to attack it? Let's hack. Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with a Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. We all know these pressure sensors from our weather stations. They are very accurate, but only good for 1100 hectopascal, which is 1.1 bar. What if we want to measure higher pressure? Then we need this kind of sensors. And if we are going to use it in a battery-operated device, maybe wirelessly coupled to our Raspberry, then we come to something like that, a ready-made tire pressure sensor. It contains all we need, a sensor, a microprocessor, a transmitter and a battery. And it only costs around $10. We even get a cheap solar-powered display for it. Cool, but how does it work? And how can we hack it? And finally, what does this all have to do with beer? First of all, what is a tire pressure monitoring system? Such a system has to alarm the driver if the vehicle loses pressure in the tires. It is mandatory for new cars. There are two completely different technologies available, direct and indirect systems. The indirect system measures the speed of the wheels. If one wheel turns faster and you drive straight, its diameter is smaller and therefore its pressure is lower. You get an alarm. I assume this technology is not very precise, but it is cheap to build and also easy to handle because you can use standard wheels and change them if you want. This system is not interesting for makers. The direct system consists of four pressure sensors which continuously monitor the tire pressure of our car and warns us if it is too high or too low. I do not know if it exists, but such a sensor in a spare wheel would be a plus. Who regularly monitors its pressure? How does direct TPMS work? If we search on YouTube, we get a lot of marketing stuff. No real information. In the aftermarket, we get two different types of sensors, internal and external ones. The internal sensors are the standard for new cars and look like that. They come attached to a valve and are mounted inside the tires like that. The external sensors can be installed on all car valves, also on your bicycle or on your bike. Because the sensors turn with the wheels, they cannot be electrically connected. Therefore, they are battery operated and establish a wireless link to the display inside the car. Most of them work on 433.92 MHz, like many of our other sensors. Some also use BLE for the transfer of the data. By the way, they not only measure pressure, they also measure temperature. The easiest way for a ham operator to check if something emits on 433 MHz, it is to take his portable radio and listen to this frequency. Unfortunately, we do not hear anything. I have quite a few sensors laying on the table, but none of them transmits. Not good, or even useless for a maker. Money spent for nothing? Why the hell I do not hear a signal? No. This time nobody can accuse me of buying cheap Chinese products. This one is made in the USA and this one is manufactured in the UK. So they must work. Or maybe the battery is flat? Cannot be. The battery is not replaceable and it should run for years. Is this long battery life the reason that I do not hear anything? Yes, the sensors do not transmit if the car does not move. With most cars anyway sitting in the garage for 23 hours a day, this saves a lot of energy. But it creates a headache for me. The applications for pressure sensors I can think of are stationary and do not move. But where do we get more information about these sensors? We are fortunate. 
Because they emit radio waves, they need a FCC approval. And part of this data supplied to the FCC is public. We just have to search it with this number here. And really, we get a hit. The external photos look very similar to the one I have here. Unfortunately, we do not find interior images. But we find a description. And this description shows that this device is way more capable or complex than I thought. It has nine different modes. Let's start with the drive mode. Obviously, this sensor, in addition to temperature and pressure, can detect movements and, on the road, transmits eight words every minute. Good to know, but I do not see how I should get into this mode. Maybe we can do some experiments later. The next is the learn mode. Each car manufacturer uses a different way to transmit its signal and sometimes the method changes with a new model. We can expect hundreds of different protocols. This is why some of these aftermarket sensors can be programmed to behave like all kinds of sensors. Maybe this is what this mode is for? Anyway, I do not know how I can motivate the sensor for that mode, nor how to program it. This is why we also can skip the factory mode. It is automatically activated after the learn mode. The sensor I have here was sold for Ford cars. Its system number is 4L2T-1A150-BB, whatever that means. The next mode is the most important for me, stationary mode. Here the sensor transmits its data every hour once, even if it is stationary. Cool. There is also no information about the off mode. Anyway, not very interesting for us. Now come the two emergency modes. They are interesting for us. Why? Because at least the fast measure mode enables us to track pressure changes. It is activated if the pressure changes 1.25 psi in 30 seconds. 1.25 psi is only 0.086 bar. Very accurate, these small things. The last mode is also interesting. It seems we can activate the sensors by a 125 kHz signal. Maybe you remember this frequency. It is used by the low-frequency RFID cards. But how to create this signal? I tried with my function generator and a coil antenna from an RFID device with no success. Not strong enough. Then I bought this activator for 10 bucks. And really, it creates a strong signal and the sensor sends its data when I point at it and press the button. But why is this necessary? Let's assume you change a tire on your car. Then you have to tell it the ID of your new sensor and also where you mounted it. Also, my other sensor works with the activator. We learned these modules have three sensors a transmitter, a receiver, an MCU and a battery. And they work for years in harsh environments. IoT at its best. Let's now look at these external sensors. They do not have an SCC number, so I have no information. We have to milk their information as we say here in the land of cows. For that we use our well-known SDR radio with some software tools. There is a big difference between these internal and the external sensors. The internal sensors were sold as replacements. The external sensors were sold as a whole system and I have a receiver which shows the measured results. Very useful for hacking, because we know the values we are looking for. If this display shows 1.8 bar and 22 degrees for the rear left wheel, we know that the signal from the RL sensor sent 1.8 bar and 22 degrees. This helps a lot for the hack. This is why I will start with these sensors. Also, they fit better the purpose I have in mind. I use the universal radio hacker tool for decoding the signals. It is made for that purpose and a real gem. 
But how can we make these sensors transmit? They are much simpler than the internal ones. They only react on changes in pressure. After thinking a little on how I can create the changing pressure, I fetched the front wheel of my bicycle and inflated it to 4 bar. Then I mounted the sensor loosely that the wheel loses pressure. Now the sensor transmits regularly changing pressure values. And we can record it with URH. We nicely see the different packages and space in between. Each chunk consists of 8 packages. Now the hacking starts. First we have to decide which modulation the device uses. Here we have three possibilities to choose from. Amplitude modulation or AM. For digital systems it is usually called amplitude shift keying or on off keying. In AM the transmitter is switched on and off according a digital signal. Frequency modulation or FM. For digital signals it is usually called frequency shift keying or FSK. Here the transmitter is always on and switches between two frequencies. The third is phase modulation which is not often used by these devices. It is called PM or PSK. Here the transmitter also is always on. From what we know it is easy to separate AM from the rest. Just try ASK and press auto detect parameters. If it is FSK the signal is always on and you see no demodulated signal. If it is FSK you should see ones and zeros here. These external sensors definitely use FSK. If we zoom in we see a typical behavior of a 433 MHz sensor. They first transmit a so-called preamble which usually consists of ones followed by zeros. This trick helps the receiver to adjust its clock, its gain and its frequency. We have to keep in mind that these devices must not cost a lot and therefore are not very precise. After this preamble they usually send a sequence to synchronize the transmitter and the receiver. The synchronization signals have to be different from the preamble and not have a regular pattern. This sensor seems to be an exception. It does not send a synchronization signal. Before we can go on we have to talk about the coding. Non return to zero or NRC and Manchester code. What is the difference and why we need two of them? NRC means that the signal does not return to zero after each bit. It therefore can have more than one logical one in a row. Which creates the problem that if the receiver is not well synchronized sometimes does not know how many ones it detected. This is why Mr. Thomas at Manchester University invented a new code which is self-clocking. This signal returns to zero after each bit. As you see here we can use the precisely same digital signal and decode it as Manchester or NRC. If you look at the binary code and you see more than three consecutive zeros or ones you can pretty sure that it is NRC coded. Manchester codes have a lot of double zeros or double ones. I leave a link if you want to know more about the different codes. Of course it would be great if we would find information about the coding in the FCC documents. But unfortunately this is rarely the case because the FCC only concentrates on the power emitted on different frequencies not the encoding of the signals. So we are on our own with guessing. Manchester or not, these sensors have to transmit an ID that your car knows which sensor belongs to which wheel. And because you are sometimes in the vicinity of other vehicles, this cannot just be number from 1 to 4. It has to be a much longer number to avoid that you see the pressure of the car close to you. And last but not least it transmits the temperature and the pressure. 
and the very last number usually is a checksum which can be used to distinguish if the signal was disturbed during its transmission. To find all the coding you have to create a lot of different signals, different sensors, different temperatures and different pressure. Then you can try to find out which bytes belong to the preamble, to the synchronization, to the ID, the temperature and the pressure. If you found this, you are not finished. You have to find out how these values are coded. For example, the temperature can be in Celsius or Fahrenheit, the pressure in PSI or bar. And sometimes the scale does not start at zero to avoid negative values. Lots of work. And if you figured everything out, you are not done. You have to find the algorithm for the calculation of the checksum. I quickly found out that the procedure with a bicycle tire is tiring and upgraded to a Swiss-made pressure chamber. It has an opening big enough for my sensors and creates a pressure of up to three bars. And it fits the fridge for temperature changes. Let's assume you have done all of that and you can decode the signals manually. Now you need the last step, a program which does all that automatically. Fortunately, we have that readily available for the 433 MHz sensors. It is called RTL 433 and it knows already a lot of sensors and immediately decodes their values. After you saw this video, you can imagine how much work is hidden in this software. And every week more is put in. I was lucky that Christian, the creator or maintainer of the program, took my samples, analyzed them and augmented the code that it can also decode these sensors. But why all this effort? First, I want to understand the TPMS sensors and find out how they work. I also read that they could be a security risk. So let's find out how a TPMS can be attacked. We have to distinguish between reading the sensors and using these readings for an evil purpose or sending wrong signals to the cockpit. Reading signals of another car seems to be easy. The reach of the transmitters is a few meters and there is no encryption used. But it is not as easy because during parking you need a lot of time and during driving you only get a signal every 30 seconds. Let's assume the reach is 20 meters in each direction and the car drives 30 kilometers or 20 miles per hour. You only can receive a signal for about 4.8 seconds. Statistically you only get a message from every 12th wheel. Not a very accurate way of detecting which car is where. It is maybe easier to read the plate with a pattern recognition software. So I would not consider this as a real problem. Sending wrong signals to the cockpit seems to be more promising. If you hate your neighbor, you could place a cheap transmitter transmitting the signal for four flat tires close to his car. This could be fun, but it is not really dangerous because he can just visually check the tires. And if he drives away, the real data of his sensors will be shown shortly. He would only have a problem if he bought a very modern car which prevents him from starting the engine with flat tires. As proof of concept, I show you how easy it is to fake a display. I use this hack RF and a few GNU radio blocks and ready is the replay attack. I recorded a flat tire before and now I send this signal to the display. And the tire seems to be flat in a second. But this is stuff for another video, if you are interested. The journey of the pressure sensors will continue. I have a fellow YouTuber called Hop Nerd, who is specialized in home brewing of beer. He wants pressure sensors on his bottles to monitor the fermenting process with his Raspberry Pi. We will see if we are successful. At least I already printed a cover for a bottle. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye.